I'd like to get your assessment of what went on over the last 24 hours. What the heck happened yesterday? <laughs> Yeah, good morning. I'm trying to work it out myself. Uh, there's a lot of ambiguity and uncertainty. So we have to go on what people said and what they did. Um, my sense is that uh, you have to view Russia as a mafia state. And so you have to judge it through uh, the lens of mafia rules. And I get the distinct impression that Prigozhin was Putin's praetorian prefect. He was there to protect him uh, against the military and other factions in the Kremlin. And somehow Prigozhin got it into his mind that actually factions in the, uh, in the Kremlin had taken over control of operations and decisions. Uh, and I'll say to you now that I think uh, Putin uh, has actually lost power in the Kremlin. It's not as a result of this action. I think he'd lost it beforehand. Uh, Prigozhin detected that. Uh, and believe it or not, Prigozhin was projecting the line that he was going to save Putin from sort of evil counselors. Uh, and this is a familiar pattern in Russian history. And I think the march on Moscow was not against Putin as such, but against yeah. I think the people that are likely to succeed Putin and are maneuvering around him even now. I don't think Putin is in control anymore. I think the factions that seek to take over from him are in control. And he was put out in front to deal with Prigozhin. And I think we'll see that dynamic play out. Putin's yeah. finished now. And I think he's just a puppet, uh, rather like another superpower, in fact. Well, that's interesting that you say that, Chris, because uh, I know yesterday you were, you were actually saying that time is running out for him. He is finished. And I wonder, Tobias Elwood, whether or not you would agree with that. I mean, do you th I mean, he is a hard man. He has got this hard man image in his own country. But yesterday he looked very shaken, didn't he? And he's, as we understand it, a man who um, is very quick to hold a grudge and also very quick to punish people. Do you think he's now going to have to do something really very unconventional to get back that hard man image? Uh, yes, certainly. I would agree with Chris Fully there. And we should expect the unconventional. It, we're in a very difficult, unpredictable mm. period. The mutiny has been diffused, but it is a game changer. Yes, the Wagner group has been neutered, uh, Prigozhin, its leader, exiled. But Putin emerges significantly weaker. And the folly and the cost of this Ukrainian war has now been exposed to the Russian public that usually get a diet of state news. Russia will now enter a darker chapter because Putin has tried to learn from his own history to make Moscow coup d'etat proof, if you like. Mm -hmm. He's likely to clamp down heavily on security. He'll hunt, hunt out dissenters. But Russian history shows it's, it's often the first wound that may not look decisive, but it triggers a series of uh, catastrophic events. And so I would agree, uh, Putin is no longer in control. He relies heavily on that hard man reputation. Mm -hmm. And in 23 years of power, his vulnerability has been exposed. How, con how concerned were you, um, as uh, in the role that you have as chair of the Defence Committee, um, knowing that Britain has got a very strong relationship with Ukraine and has really been at the forefront of all the, the, the hardware that we provided them to, to fight this war against Russia? How concerned were, the, were you yesterday that the leader of another NATO country, Erdogan in Turkey, was the first man to pick up the telephone and actually congratulate Putin on what had happened yesterday, um, effectively saying, you know, well done? <laughs> Well, uh, Erdogan's uh, comments uh, aren't out of character. Don't forget, he and indeed Hungary have denied Sweden and Finland from uh, mm -hmm. swift entry uh, into NATO. Sweden is still not a member. I mean, from Ukraine's perspective, let's just digest that for a second. You know, Russian leaders are in disagreement, distracted, even fighting amongst each other. The orders are not getting through to the Ukrainian front line. That's clear. Morale of the Russian soldier, already low, will continue to ebb. And Putin has lost uh, the ability of his most elite force to operate as part of his land combat formations in Ukraine. So there's clearly an opportunity for Ukraine to exploit this unprecedented turn of events. I'm absolutely right. Ukraine should not hesitate. But it would be wrong for the international community to then to get involved in, this, in any of this. We have to work with Russia uh, post Putin. We have to work with Russia to find the necessary off ramps that allow us you know, in the decades to follow, uh, to come to some form of accommodation. So how we act, what we do in the next days and weeks and so forth, will be absolutely critical here.
Yeah, Chris, let's talk about that force, the Wagner force, because they were reckoned to be the elite troops. I know they were a kind of ragtag group, a bunch of misfits on the whole, people out of prison and goodness knows what else. But they were thought to be the elite troop, the, the really force to be reckoned with. Um, but um, Prigozhin was saying that the, the, um, the army was using them as cannon fodder, and that was what he was objecting to. Now, he's going to go to Belarus. He's, he's been sent off there. He's not going to be leading his men anymore. Those men are now apparently going to be integrated into the Russian army, the very army that Prigozhin was saying is not being used properly. What effect do you think this is now going to have on those forces? Are they going to be prepared now they've lost the man who was their, their leader? Are they going to now be subjected to all the, 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 the problems that Prigozhin was mentioning in terms of the way that the army and the, in fact the, the entire um, event in Yugoslavia is being handled. In Ukraine, you mean? Mm. Oh, yeah. Sorry, in Ukraine. My apologies. Yes. <laughs> if we're going for Yugoslavia, we need to worry. Yeah, um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, we, okay, there's quite a few questions there. Um, I think, first of all, Angela, we've got to understand they're not an elite force. They're a shock force, uh, and they achieve that by using maximum violence and not really obeying the rules of, of war. Um, you know, it's a pretty nasty outfit, and uh, they, they get their way simply by being more violent and more ruthless than any other unit can be. Um, even the, the Russian army is frightened of them. When Prigozhin said, look, you know, we'll, ki we'll kill and destroy anything that gets in our way, most Russians would have believed that. Um, so that's the first thing. Secondly, uh, Prig Prigozhin is the political figurehead of Wagner. He's also the CEO. Uh, the generals who actually run the Wagner group are still in place, uh, and they will be there, obviously, defending their corner. Um, the the issue of I, I can't stress enough, Angela, that the that Prigozhin and the Wagner group are now facing whoever are the factions who are taking over from Putin now. This is not a Putin issue. And, it, and one of the things we have to prepare ourselves for now is dealing with a very disparate, uh, very divided Kremlin. I, I don't believe Putin is actually making the decisions. Uh, and that is really dangerous. And so anything to do with Ukraine right now, we're going to have to identify who the power brokers are. And I keep saying to people, if you've seen the film The Death of Stalin, this is what is going on in the Kremlin at the moment. All the cultural uh, in, infighting uh, uh, is taking place. And Prigozhin, I think, saw that. And his, his, his revolt was against that rather than Putin himself. Indeed, that's what he said. Uh, and we've got to listen to that. And one of those factions was the Russian army under Shoigu and Gerasimov. Uh, so we've got to see how the pieces are moving on the board right now. But we shouldn't be under any, any illusions. Putin is not in control. You were nodding your head in agreement there, Tobias. I mean, we, we think that Putin is perhaps um, now the hyenas are circling around him, aren't they? They certainly are. What are we going to think very briefly is going to happen to Prigozhin himself? He's been um, exiled now to Belarus. I mean, is he a marked man? Is he going to be another one that's going to fall out of a window somewhere or get poisoned by an umbrella? What's his future? Yeah, I, they obviously, I think he's going to be <laughs> going to be very careful what he eats and where he goes and so forth. But uh, I think the focus has to be on, on on Putin. He relies on his own credibility, his own legitimacy. Uh, he relies heavily on the loyalty of, sec of his security apparatus. And he relies on the ability to throw large sums of money and resources at any problem, whatever the cost, including life. And in all three of those areas, you know, that he's been seriously weakened. The streets of Moscow having to be defended by tank regiments, his mo most loyal, most competent, as Chris says, most violent force has now turned on him. And of course, those sanctions are starting to bite uh, and uh, affecting the Kremlin's coffers. So, uh, you know, we see this. Uh, the death of Stalin is, uh, you know, wise to be watched, I think, again. Russia traditionally likes strong leaders to hold the motherland, the complex, disparate motherland together to protect it. But when a leader loses popularity amongst the elites or demonstrates weakness, as history shows, the Kremlin can be very swift and ruthless to replace them. But in this case, it is complicated because there's an awful lot of people have been waiting for this moment, unimpressed by what's going on in Ukraine, seeing that Putin's stock, after being so high, after holding the country together after this collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, is clearly on its way out. Yeah, well, I'm going to be talking to somebody, one of the Ukrainian um, ministers a bit later on in the programme. But in the meantime, Chris and Tobias, thank you both very much indeed for that.